I'm glad that you all are here today. Um, so this is a, a, a great sort of beginning for us uh, with the Jaffa Center for Muslim World Studies uh, at FIU in our partnership with Rashid Al Ansar. This is going to be the first of hopefully a series of annual lectures in partnership um, in terms of expanding how we understand and we write the history of the Muslim world. And one of the things that's very important is the history of African American Muslims um, in the United States, and particularly something that hasn't, a lot of work hasn't been done on, is the history of African American Muslims um, in, the, in the South. And so what we're trying to do today is trying to understand what were those experiences like? We're trying to understand and document um, the, the great personalities, men and women, that helped to establish the faith uh, in this country, and also understand where we are now at the, at the crux of history. So we have a generation of leaders who are now passing the torch on to a new generation. And what are the major challenges that our communities are facing in terms of the 21st century? How do we keep the faith vibrant? And how do we make it something um, that is able to honor the sacrifices of the past, that the faith is able to engage in interfaith dialogue with other faith communities in making um, this society both open um, to people of different sort of uh, races and um, religions, um, and at the same time, giving some sort of meaningful answer to the major questions that we face today. Questions like climate change, questions like social justice. Um, what can our community, what is our vision? What is our guidance? What is the knowledge that we've, we've gained over the last century that we can help to help Americans sort of answer these really important questions? Um, and so that's kind of what we want to do today, to, to bring uh, the leading sort of scholars and personalities of our community forward to record their responses and hopefully begin a discussion um, between the community and academia in terms of preserving the history of the community um, and sort of their ideas and sort of how we can create a better um, and more prosperous future for all. So I will very briefly um, introduce myself. My name is Iqbal Akhtar, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies and Politics and International Relations. Um, and I'm also part of the Jaffer Center for Muslim World Studies. Um, and the, the rest of the panel, um, I'll really briefly sort of mention. Um, we have Professor Michael Mohammed Knight, who is an assistant professor of religion and cultural studies at the University of Central Florida. He's the author of 12 books, Five Percenters, Islam, Hip Hop, and Gods of uh, New York and Mohammed, um, 40 Introductions. His 30th book, um, 13th book, sorry, <laughs> Not uh, Metaphysical Africa. Truth and Blackness in the Ansaro Allah Community is forthcoming in fall of 2020. We're very honored that he's been able to join us here um, from, uh, from Orlando, from the University of Central Florida. We have Imam Nasser, who is one of the leading um, founders of the community, an important personality. He's the Imam of this mosque, and he's also an oral surgeon. He has many different hats, um, but you, you would know him best by the main fatigue here at, at the mosque, who has incredible depth in his theology and his understanding of Islam through the African American experience. Um, his writings on, it, on, on the Quran are, are unbelievable and that's something that we want to be able to preserve um, to, to, and also to record that history. Um, the theology is just unbelievable. We have um, Judge uh, Norman Hemming who is here. He presently serves as the Chief Administrative Law Judge in the South Florida hearing, uh, hearing Office of the Social Security Administration. He served 14 years with the U.S. Attorney's Office um, for the Southern District of Florida. Now, Judge Hemi, for those of you who know, he's incredibly active in the interfaith community here. He's a pillar of the African American community, um, a great scholar of Christianity in his own right, um, and we're very honored to have him as a bridge, um, a bridging sort of the African American Christian and Muslim communities together. We have Dr. Dr. Uh, Akram Hami, who serves as Vice President of the National League of Muslim Women, South uh, Florida chapter, is also a member of Miami PAC, an interfaith organization. Her areas of emphasis include organizational culture, leadership development, and serving humanity. We also have on the panel 
Brother Mikhail, who is also one of the founders of this community, uh, a leading scholar, and he's also a, a naturopath. Um, so he's well versed in sort of the, the medical arts as well. And so we are very honored to have um, all of them bring their perspectives on the history of the community, the wisdom of this community, and sort of ideas about moving forward. So what we're trying to do with this is, ideally this is gonna be the beginning of a series of discussions that we're gonna have. And we would also like to then apply to the National Endowment of the Humanities for funding in terms of developing an, uh, an archive of this material, interviewing people, and then publishing sort of the work and the writings of um, the illustrious members of this community. So we're very honored that you guys are here with the launch, um, with FIU in a partnership with Mashallah Ansar. And the, the format will be um, about 15 or 20 minutes. Each of the panel members will come up and talk about um, their perspective on the history of the community, um, their views in terms of uh, sort of academic uh, writings and ideas of sort of, of how we can move forward um, as a community. And then after everyone has their say, then we'll have um, a short sort of uh, question and answer session and then we'll uh, adjourn for some snacks downstairs. All right, so thank you so much. Yeah, we had uh, a unique situation in trying to put this program together. <laughs> and we are thankful to Almighty God that he blessed us to bring the human beings together. And behind the scenes, he knows what I'm talking about. But you are most welcome to be here at this masjid. It is the first oldest masjid in the state of Florida. And we have to give our respects to our good friend, Dr. Misbah, sitting right here to the right, all the way up front, who was the one that came and reminded me of our responsibility as Muslims to educate and to help the society at large. I would like you to know, Mikhail Hamid, this gentleman here, he is our director of the American Coalition for Good Government, and that is the social arm, social political arm of the mosque to try to establish social relationships that Dr. Dickball mentioned. So I just want you all to know that who, who he is and who Dr. Mispa is. Thank you very much. All right, so, uh, two more things before, yes, before, you, before we start. Um, one is that there's a survey that's going around, so at the end of it, at the end of the lecture, please um, write a, uh, fill out the survey um, so we know how to um, better do these programs in the future. And the last thing, this is a personal request, um, Brownsville Community Garden, we're having a um, uh, planting day on Good Friday. So if you guys are willing to come up, we're gonna have 50 students that are gonna be coming around from Brownsville, Liberty City. Um, it'd be wonderful for you to come out from 9 to 12 and help us to plant the garden. All right, so with that, I will begin with um, Professor Knight, if you would please come and, um, and uh, give us a short lecture. So first, I, I begin with gratitude for being invited to the space and to take part in this conversation. Sure. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Uh, so again, I, I begin with gratitude for being invited and included in this conversation in this space. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, and I have, I have some conversation starters that could be productive and fruitful perhaps, but uh, I really feel like the, the conversation is more fruitful than simply what I have to say. So uh, I'm gonna be brief. I'm not uh, a specialist specifically in the South. Uh, I do Islamic studies at UCF. Within that, I do American Islam, which is my publishing record is uh, focused on African American Islam. Specifically the 5% our community in the Nation of Islam that I, I will touch on briefly. Uh, and my next work is on a different community of, of the Ansala law uh, that begins in Brooklyn and ends in, uh, or moves later to Georgia. So thinking about American Islam, generally and African American Islam specifically, in the South, uh, that there were two things that immediately jumped out at me. And again, I study American Islam broadly, um, not specifically the South. But first, the histories of enslaved Muslims 
that in recent decades we've only started to really build on and uncover. The, the history of American religion uh, for much of that field's development as, as an academic specialization was the study of white Protestants, right? So other communities, other traditions were not considered part of the, the larger story of American religion. Uh, and as the religion of enslaved peoples becomes more of a focus of academic attention, uh, there's been more of an effort to recover American Muslim histories that are in fact older than America as a concept, right? That there were Muslims here before we call this place America, right? Um, a couple uh, key examples, key points there. There are numerous stories that we're uncovering of communities and individuals who came to the Americas as Muslims. I'm going to focus on the, the American South here. Um, who came here as Muslims and struggled to survive and maintain some sense of their identity and tradition while surviving. So there, there's these complex questions of how they manage how they negotiate, how they navigate their own traditions in this hostile environment. Right, so uh, we have cases such as uh, Omar bin Said in the Carolinas, um, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman, uh, who ostensibly, you know, by all appearances, convert to Christianity during their, their time of enslavement in the Americas. Uh, but when we look closer at what they leave behind in their records, uh, that gets much more complicated. Right, so um, in the case of Ibrahim Abdul Rahman, uh, we have an example of him writing the Lord's Prayer in Arabic on request, and then on closer examination, someone looked at it and said, look, that's, that's what the Fatima. He didn't write the Lord's Prayer, he wrote the sort of Quran. Right? Um, likewise, you know, over at Said in the Carolinas, uh, ostensibly, you know, as far as we can tell, was a Christian. But when we look at his Bible, we find dedications to the public. So that's it. Uh, religious identity, you know, not only is it complicated for people who cannot necessarily openly express their religion as they understand it, right? But also, the religious identities that they're coming from are, are complex. So we can't read their minds. We're not in their hearts. Right, but we have these traces of ambiguity. We have these, these moments where a question can be asked whether their public conversion necessarily reflected what was in their heart, what their faith was, or is this what they have to do to survive in, in a violent, hostile context. Right? We also have Muslims in this context who openly profess Islam. So in the Sapo Island community in Georgia, was led by a man named Bilali Muhammad, who was Bilali Muhammad, right? Um, and it was observably Muslim. So people who visited him, who knew him, said he used to pray three times a day. They didn't see him when he woke up, and they didn't see him when he went to bed. So they missed two. But he prayed three times, he prayed five times a day, and left a text behind that was, you know, speculated for some time. What, what is this, what is this text leaving behind? It was, written by hand from memory of a classical you know, Islamic jurisprudence text, right? So there's Islamic knowledge production happening among the slave peoples in America. Uh, so if there's cases like that, um, the study of Islam among enslaved people that's very difficult to uncover. Uh, one of the leading scholars on this, Michael Gomez, made a really compelling argument for the proliferation of um, enslaved African Muslims in the Americas. Uh, there's a challenge in some of this approach because he uses what's, what we might call a phone book approach where he's looking at newspaper articles, sometimes advertisements about runaway enslaved peoples, uh, and he's looking for names. He's looking for names that sound Muslim-ish, right? So he finds a Fatima, he finds a Musa, and he says, well, this is where the Muslims are. Uh, there's a challenge to that because, again, we're thinking about the complex religious identities that people are coming from. So we don't necessarily know that everyone named Musa or Fatima is Muslim. And also, there are people who may not have immediately recognizable Muslimish names that were Muslim. So we might falsely count people on both sides. Um, but it's an immense contribution. I recommend that book, Black Crescent by Michael Gomez. Um, 
but the field is growing, it's expanding, it's developing, it's building on this past work. The, the second thing, and again, because I want to keep my remarks brief and open it to conversation, uh, apart from the difficulty of recovering African Muslim histories in the Americas, people that I would call the founding fathers of American Islam come from the South. And this also includes founding mothers. That history is in greater danger of being lost, and it's harder to recover also. But I want to include them as well. Founding fathers and founding mothers. Uh, when we look at the people who produced American Islam in the 20th century, this 20th century renaissance and revival of Islam in African American communities, we're looking at people who survived the Great Migration from the South to the North. We think of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we think of Georgia, we think of Noble Draw Ali, uh, who was born in Kentucky as, as a um, very recent scholarly intervention that's argued uh, by David Dorman, the Princess and the Prophet. Um, they came from the Great Migration, they came from the South to the North, they came into a, a very complex religious milieu in the urban North. Um, I, I can say more about that when I want to leave time for the conversation. Uh, and they produced the movements that, that gave us a distinct American Islamic tradition. Uh, there are arguments about a through line, about a continuity between enslaved African Muslims and these 20th century revival movements, this 20th century renaissance. Um, I can't pronounce judgment on those arguments, but uh, people have, have made that, that argument. Uh, so these, these are the two things that, that I look at. I'm thinking about the histories that are being recovered I'm thinking about enslaved Muslim histories, and I'm thinking about, in terms of the South, what the South means for movements such as the Water Science Temple of America, the Nation of Islam, the Five Percent Movement, which also was started by men from Virginia. Uh, and again, thinking in terms of the South, I don't specialize in the South, but this is also the city where the most famous Muslim conversion ever in the history of the world happened, right? Because in terms of a real time, the world witnesses it kind of conversion. You know, we, we weren't all there when Umar converted or when Abu Bakr converted, right? But um, in terms of the whole world registering that someone had accepted Islam in a very public way, that was here in Miami, right, in 1964. So I just want to leave that noted. Um, and you know, there, there's a lot of different directions. I know this is kind of all over the place. There's a lot of different directions we can go in. I look forward to a, a fruitful conversation with everyone. Thank you so much. Thank Islam. you. So I'm the I'm the, the, the one not scholar on this uh, panel, right? Because everyone else is uh, published. Um, but I'd like to come to talk a little bit about um, Islam in the South from a perspective that includes a Caribbean perspective, as even further south than Florida, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. In the in the 25th surah, in the 63rd verse, it says the the servants of um, the All Merciful are they who walk humbly upon the face of the earth. And when the ignorant speak, they respond salam or peace. Now it's interesting because this um, 25th surah is called the al furqan which means the criterion. And this, this criterion is for doing good versus doing evil. And uh, when we see uh, the presence of Islam in the, in the southern United States, and even further south um, in the Caribbean, it seems that it was always doing good. But when we look at the history of Islam um, in terms of African um, influence in, in Islam, we have to go further back than just um, here in, in the United States. So we have to take ourselves all the way back to the, the Moorish um, influence in um, Europe, because that informs how it is that Islam first comes to the southern United States. Um, so we have to look at the Moorish um, infiltration and uh, domination in areas like um, France, which exists to this day in this area called the Petit Afrique, right? We have to look at um, the Moorish domination. These are North African nations, <laughs> right? Um, in, in Italy and also in Spain. And then we have to look at the fact um, that what happened after they were expelled 
uh, from these areas in, in Europe and how did they make their way 